Hello everyone, Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense. Thank you for watching. I have another Monday quarterback video for you. I'm going to play the entirety of this video without any interruption, and then I'll go back and talk about things that I think were done right and or done wrong, and explain things so that you have a better understanding of what's going on. Without further ado, here we go. Hello, I'm Sergeant Ann Justice with the Phoenix Police Department Public Affairs Bureau. The information, audio, video, and pictures you are about to see are intended to provide details, as we currently understand them, of an officer-involved shooting that occurred just after midnight on January 8, 2022. This video may contain strong language as well as graphic images, which could be disturbing to some people. Viewer discretion is advised. This incident occurred in the area of 51st Avenue and Baseline, when a witness called 911 to report a man breaking into a business. The man was later identified as 26-year-old Matthew Bia. Here is audio from the 911 call. Phoenix 911, where is your emergency? Hi, the plaza off of, I guess, I don't know, the, the plaza um, off 51st Avenue and Baseline. What's going on over there? Um, it looks like somebody was trying to break into the... Um, I was walking out. Then I was walking out. I heard, a I heard a loud bang. Um, it looked like some guy was trying to get in through the front door. He was definitely not. I mean, it was definitely forceful. And was he white, black, Hispanic, and Asian? Uh, from what I saw, I'd say he was like Native, Native American, uh, bigger set. Do you remember what he was wearing? Um, he's wearing a black hoodie, it looks like. Black jeans, yeah. Any weapons now he's that walking, you know he's, I'm sorry. Any weapons that you know of? Uh, just the ones that he is using to break into the. He's in there now. He's in there now. He just he just got inside right now. Yep. Video surveillance from the business showed Bia unsuccessfully attempt to break the glass door for almost two minutes. After unsuccessful attempts, Bia returned two minutes later with an object and was able to break the glass and enter the store. Once inside the closed business, Bia walked around and attempted to manipulate the registers. Body-worn cameras are used by all officers assigned to patrol and several specialty units. Per policy, they are worn at mid-torso level and capture the view of the line of sight from that perspective. It is important to note that the camera lens is fixed and does not capture everything seen or experienced by the officer. When activated, both audio and video turn on. The body-worn camera has a buffer of video without audio for 30 seconds prior to activation. This feature is designed to capture incidents that happen suddenly where an officer doesn't immediately activate the camera. The Phoenix Police Department does not currently use in-car camera systems. When the first officer arrived, he parked his vehicle in front of the store. He saw Bia inside the business and attempted to speak to him. Hey, come out! If I don't want King, I've got one at gunpoint. He's got his hands below his head. He looks extremely 390. He's uh, still inside the building. Hey! Step out of the building. Let me see your hands. The officer gave Bia commands to come out of the store, but he refused. Can you come out of the building? No. Well, you got in there, so come on out, man. The officer moved to a position of cover behind his patrol vehicle and began to order Bia to show him his hands, but he refused. Hey, get your hands out of your pants. 
Get your hands out of your pants, dude. Let me see your fucking hands. Show me your hands. I need to see your other hand. Security footage from inside the store showed Bia standing at the broken door as the officer gave him commands. After a few moments, Bia, with his left hand on his head, moved his right hand to his waistline and turned sideways so that his right side was away from the officer. He then extended his hand and arm quickly from his waist towards the officer. That's when the officer involved shooting occurred. The officer fired one round and Bia fell to the ground but it was later determined he was not struck by the bullet. The bullet was recovered from the doorframe. Due to the officer's position behind the vehicle, the body-worn camera footage from the shooting is obstructed. Here is that video. Show me your hand, dude. Hey, 31 King, 9 and 8. Show me your hand, dude. Eight thirty one King nine and eight. After the shooting, Bia continued to extend his arm forward in the direction of the officer. After about four minutes, he complied with the officers, crawled out of the store, and laid on the ground. Officers moved towards Bia okay. and placed him yeah. under arrest. Ready? Go ahead and go engage. Come on! What the fuck? No weapon was found on or around Bia. Bia was not injured by the shot. He did suffer minor injuries to his hands from the broken glass door. Bia was booked into jail for aggravated assault on a police officer, burglary, and criminal damage. There was one officer involved in this incident. He has approximately two years of service and is assigned to the Maryville Estrella Mountain Precinct. This incident is the subject of both an internal and criminal investigation, which will be reviewed by the Maricopa County Attorney's Office. Conclusions about whether the actions of the officer are consistent with department policy and the law will not be made until all facts are known and the investigation is complete. This video was intended to inform and educate the public about a critical incident in our community. You can learn about the Phoenix Police Department's transparency policy on our website. So, again, another good example of a briefing. They lay out all the facts pretty good, and nothing wrong with how they have um, laid out the facts here. So, a person calls 911 and reports that he sees a person who appears to be breaking into the store. And <clears throat> Arizona must have... Um, some type of law in place when it comes to like open record stuff that has them uh, blur out the names of businesses and things like that. Because um, I noticed uh, that they will blur those things out. Each state is a little bit different on how they do um, their open records laws, and. Uh, that is that's, that can be expected to, to blur out business names and stuff like that and blur out um, complete addresses uh, obviously things like social security numbers and stuff like that will be blurred out and then even in some places they even go so far as to blur out any type of medical stuff even like in a spoken word so the video I did about uh, Millville New Jersey the family calling in to report that their family member was uh, suffering some uh, mental illness and was having a, uh, an episode. Uh, they blurred out the family member saying specifically uh, what was going on because they had laws that uh, prohibit them from releasing uh, 
medical information on people. And some agencies will will redact the important stuff, the obvious stuff. Some go a little bit above and beyond um, what the merit of those laws are. And we'll, we'll censor out a bunch of other stuff that doesn't really necessarily need to be censored out. They get a little censor happy, in my opinion. Um, but, uh, yeah, he reports this person uh, trying to break into the store. Now, exactly at what point he sees this guy trying to break in, I'm not really sure. I wish that would be some information they would include. Um but this guy, I don't know what he has. It almost looks like a tire. And it could also be the top off of a, uh, a, a, a trash can. Um, some public trash cans will have like this round metal top on top of it to kind of keep the bag secured in place. And uh, that could be what it is. Um, but it doesn't look like a tire. And if it's a tire, I mean, this guy's kind of stupid if he thinks that a rubber tire is going to break a window. But after unsuccessful attempt, I'm kind of thinking it might be the top of a, of a trash can or something like that. So the person calling 911, uh, if he was witnessing what was going on and he's a safe enough distance away and he sees him doing this, that guy could have easily just yelled out across the street or across the parking lot and said, hey, I'm calling the police. And this dude, with good certainty, probably would have ran. And although he may have gotten away, you know, got to somewhere and hid from the police, um, that's a, that's a real possibility, but it would have at least prevented him from actually making entry into this building and then creating an unsafe uh, scenario for the police to have to go in and search this building and find this guy and then him potentially have a gun and get into a shootout with him. So, you know, I, I don't always advocate that people get involved in things that do not pertain to them, but by all means, if there's a, a way that you can safely do it, you know, you're you're across the street, uh, there's some distance involved. If the person starts to head towards your way, you can easily make a fast egress. You're not going to be trapped in. They're not going to be able to get to you very quickly. And by all means, uh, make some noise. Let those people know that they're being watched. Um, tell them the police are being called. Um, even if you don't have a phone on you or you haven't called the police, you can still yell, hey, uh, the police are on their way. Or We've called the police, something like that. And most people, most criminals, uh, when they hear that crap, or even when they just hear that, like, there's someone there, or someone's watching them, they'll scatter. Like, they don't, they don't want to be caught. They don't want to go to jail. Um, jail sucks. Um, even though a lot of them don't end up spending a whole lot of time in there, uh, they end up getting released a little too early, they still, it's, it's still viewed as a, inconvenience to them. They don't like going to it. The conditions do kind of suck. The food sucks. But that is to be expected for jail. Jail should not be country club. It should not be something people enjoy going to. It needs to suck ass, right? So, most criminals, you make some noise, they're going to run away. Even like with home invasion stuff, I can't tell you how many times I've heard 911 calls and the person starts If they would just fucking yell, like, hey, get out of here. Chances are that person who's banging on that door trying to get in, um, they're going to leave. Unless it's like a domestic kind of thing um, where they don't really care and they're still coming in and they're going to do their harm. But if it's like like a legit burglar trying to jiggle the door and try to get in because they think no one's there, and all you do is whisper, guess what? They're going to assume that no one's there. But as soon as someone starts making noise... They're going to scatter because, again, they don't like jail. Jail sucks. So the person who called 911, um, I think that if it was safe for them to do so, I think that if they would have made some noise, this guy would have scurried away. And he wouldn't be able to make entry into this building um, and call 
cause damage and create a dangerous situation for police when they had to go in there and look for them. The timestamp, 2355, and then when he is rummaging around with the uh, cash registers, we get about uh, five minutes time elapsed, and then with the him getting here and the police, it's uh, midnight one. So there's not a whole lot of time that elapses between the 911 call and the police getting there. So that's a pretty decent uh, response time. But uh, when he does finally get there, he does um, end up parking to the very front of the business. Um, so that kind of, you know, brings into, you know, schools of thought on, you know, where to park at for a burglary call or, or something like that. And uh, you'll hear some advocate that you need to park um, a distance away and um, make your approach on foot. And, and I can see that being a, a pretty good option, especially when you're dealing with a big glass front thing here and you pull in and it's nighttime, your headlights are reflecting off the windows and you can't see very well and someone's inside with a gun um, hiding behind a counter and they can see you get out and make that approach to that window and start shooting. Um, he's also obviously here all completely by himself and he doesn't have any backup. So um, it makes me wonder like if this dude did not come to the front door when he did and make himself shown, what was this officer all by himself going to do? Was he going to go towards that broken door and, and start giving verbal commands for someone to come out when he's there all by himself? Um, I don't think that would be a smart thing to do, but I, I don't know what his intentions were. Um, I think it would have been a better tactic to park uh, down the street, uh, not too far. I mean, not like you got to walk a mile to get there, but um, park a little bit away from the front door. That way someone can't get a drop on you and get a rifle out. Um, this is a call of a person who's breaking into a business and they've successfully broken into the business. Um, the caller was able to advise the dispatcher that the person has now made entry into the building and you would have to assume that the dispatcher had relayed that information to the officer. So the officer should be going to this call with the knowledge that someone's already gone into the building or in there. And that that means that a building search uh, is, is likely and if you're going to be doing a building search you need to get your rifle out because a building search can turn into a gunfight real quick and if you're going to be doing anything that could be turning into a gunfight you want to have a rifle a rifle will stop a fight a lot faster than a pistol and some people will squabble about, you know, pistols during, or rifles in building searches, you know, oh, you know, it's too long, it takes up too much space. If you do full extension with your arms, with your pistol, like you do your normal shooting stance, you go put your back to a wall, put your back to a wall, and get your pistol out and do full extension like you would normally shoot, and have someone off to the side, kind of gauge it by eye and see on the floor in front of you roughly about where your muzzle ends and have them put a mark on the floor, you know, lay something down and kind of mark, you know, this imaginary wall where your muzzle touches and then get your rifle out and back to the wall, shoulder your rifle and have it sticking out and you're going to find that um, between your pistol and both hands being fully extended out like you normally shoot and you shouldering your rifle and its muzzle that the pistol muzzle and the rifle muzzle when you kind of do the, the measuring and looking and see exactly where each of these come out to they're both going to be about the same it's, it's a negligible difference in length between you holding your hands out holding a pistol versus you holding a rifle and that muzzle point now it's a very negligible difference um, the only time that you're going to get a very noticeable difference is if you are rocking like a full-sized battle rifle like a barrel with like 20 some inches on it which fucking no one does like no one carries a battle rifle around 
and in the car. Uh, it's all carbines. So, I think I should have said that. You know, take your carbine and, and shoulder it. You're going to be a negligible uh, difference in length. It's They're pretty much the damn same. Uh, it's only when you start getting into battle rifles with long barrels that you, that you notice that there's a difference. Um, so, the argument that, uh, you know, carbines are too big for building searches is just it's stupid. Uh, that's an old way of thinking. That comes from, you know, days by gone, right? Like, this is like old school thinking process. Um, and that's stuff that's kind of carried down throughout the years and it's regurgitated by people. And it's it still lingers in some areas because a lack of good, adequate training and people always regurgitating the same bullshit and not going out and getting... Uh, good information from different places. They just kind of stay within their own, own echo chamber. Um, but yeah, um, a situation like this where you're going to have to potentially go into a building and do a building search, like get your rifle out. Like if you're going to do a building search, there's a potential for you coming across someone in there and them really being motivated and not wanting to go to jail and trying to kill you to prevent you uh, taking them to jail. And they'll, you know, They'll fight you to the death for it. So if that potential exists, get your rifle out. Rifles beat pistols. Every day of the week. I don't give a shit what you say. Um, but the guy, he just rolls up, leaves at the front door, and uh, the guy starts acting erratically. Now, this looks similar to like a suicide by police kind of thing where he's kind of making it look like he's got a gun in his waistband and, uh, and he pulls, you know, makes a really quick movement like he's pulling a gun out and trying to aim it and fire it. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, this, this could be a for sure suicide by police kind of thing where he decide that he's going to break into a place and get the police to come out there. Um, and when they get there, he's going to come out and, and do this thing and get shot by them. Um, I don't know. I don't know what this guy's intentions were. Uh, obviously, though, uh, his actions warranted him being shot. Uh, the officer acted accordingly. The officer... Uh, believed that this guy was pulling a gun out and was about to shoot him, which is evident when you see the officer jerk back away from his um, vehicle like, like he does. Show me your hand, dude! Like, he legitimately, I believe, uh, believed that this guy was pulling a gun out. That's why he jerks back so quick. So, it's very clear, very obvious that the officer was in fear for his life. And this guy presented the, the situation to make it seem as if he had a gun and was and trying to pull it on this officer. This guy brought this shit upon himself. Um, and as I said, he didn't get shot. The door itself took the round. And that kind of goes into, you know, the talk about... Uh, accuracy and missed rounds and whatnot. So um, it's kind of a, a common thing for police to miss during gunfights. After the shooting, Bia continued to extend his arm forward in the direction of the officer. After about to under yeah. arrest. Ready. Injured by the shot, Bia was booked into jail for minor injuries to his hands. Bia was not injured by the No weapon was No weapon was found. Well, I don't know where it shows the, the bullet out of the door. It continued to extend his arm forward. After the shooting, Bia continued to extend his arm forward in the direction struck by the bullet. The bullet was recovered from the door frame. All right, so he obviously missed. 
Um, the dude was standing more in the open right here in the open door. He fired and the bullet hit here, way off mark. Um, when it, and this is another, uh, another reason why rifles should be used. Uh, rifles are going to be more accurate. You're going to have more points of contact on that rifle and you have a longer barrel on it. When you're dealing with pistols, pistols have a short barrel. And when you are, um, as you increase your distance um, between the muzzle and the target, the further distance you get, uh, with that short barrel, the minimalist amount of movement within that gun um, will increase the amount of distance between uh, your point of aim and, and where the, the bullet's going to strike at. And, and it's going to vary um, with other factors like um, trigger control um, and, you know, how good of... Um, front sight focus you got going on. Things like grip and kind of stance, we'll, we'll go a little bit into it. Um, but pistols overall, you know, at, at a certain distance, they kind of suck for accuracy, especially under very dynamic scenarios. If you're 25 yards away and you're on a shooting range and you've got a target pistol and you've got the time to get your sights on target and control your breathing and squeeze off that shot very well yeah of course you can make great freaking shots like that at that distance on a shooting range but that's completely unrealistic in real life when you don't necessarily get to make the choice firsthand to shoot. You're having to respond to a stimuli, usually a uh, perceived about to die kind of stimuli, and you're having to make that shot under duress. And so you're obviously not going to be as accurate when that happens as you would if you was on a shooting range without your paper target shooting back at you or do anything to, to cause seriously bodily harm or death to you. So there is a huge difference in shooting range stuff and real world application. And real world application misses occur. You know, in training we always talk about uh, every round that you fire uh, has your name on it, you're accountable for every round. Yes, that's true. Um, and we can make ourselves better with more training and more practice. and for a lot of agencies, it's hard uh, to be able to meet the practice part. Uh, the training part um, happens after being hired um, in most places. Um, <clears throat> most places, once they hire, um, you know, you don't do anything work-wise. You go to the academy and then you come back and you go to work. But there are some places out there that still will hire, put people on the street until an opening comes um, open at the academy, and this is in the academy, uh, but usually that person is paired with someone and they're not all by themselves, but although there are some places that probably still do that kind of crap. Um, but, you know, generally after being hired, they get, go through the training, and at some point within, you know, like 20-something like week or, you know, 15-week block of training, depends on where you're at, um, they get a block of firearms instruction. And uh, at the at those academies, the, the firearms instruction can be pretty decent. And that um, is, for a lot of officers across this nation, um, the only good training they'll get in their career. Because once they come back to their agency, they do mostly qualification stuff once a year. And a qualification is not training whatsoever. Not at least a bit. It's just shooting range stuff. Um, and, and really, I mean, obviously, you know, some training is shooting range stuff, but um, it's it's purely just marksman, marksmanship stuff at that point when you do qualification for the most part. Um, some places will do it twice a year. That's a very 
uh, minimalist kind of thing. You have to meet the bare minimum requirements for qualification. You stand at certain distances, fire X amount of rounds at those certain distances, and you will do at one distance standing, another distance kneeling, and then one distance, you know, you use your non-dominant hand. And, you know, it can be somewhere between 50 to 100 rounds fired for qualification. And in a lot of places, that's only done once a year. Some places do it two times, some places do it three, some places do it four. Um, but the ones who do it the most are far and few between. It's usually places with better budgets. Uh, most police agencies here in the U.S. are poor, and they can't afford to do a whole lot. They can't afford to buy the ammo. And, um, and so it's usually just once or twice a year. And then uh, beyond that, um, you know, they might be able to get some force on force training after the academy if it comes available to them they might have available to them the, the fat simulator where they get the uh, video game gun and they got the screen big screen thing right in front of them doing like a video thing and they can shoot at the screen like a video game um, that can give them some some better realistic training um, but as far as you know getting back to what their firearms training was like when they got at the academy, where they got to spend multiple days on it, um, there's so many places where they that's the only time they ever get to see that stuff. They don't ever get to see that again. And any time they do training or practice with their firearms, it's very short-natured. It's very short-lived. Um, it usually consists of qualification stuff, and then at most, if they do anything, it lasts like maybe an 8-hour block or a 10, 12-hour block out of the day and that's the reality for firearms training for cops in the u.s and another thing that a lot of people don't realize is there are a lot of cops out there who the only reason why they have a gun is because their employer gave it to them and it's a condition of their employment that they carry the damn thing if it weren't for that they wouldn't have a gun uh, lots of cops are non-gun people and so when it comes to these agencies that they can't do a whole lot of firearms training and or practice, then the officers themselves, they're not going to take it upon themselves to go buy their own ammo and go practice when they should be because uh, they're just not gun people. Um, there's very few officers in this entire country who are um, true practitioners uh, of the martial art, I guess you could say when it comes to gun stuff um, and will actually go out, buy ammo on their own dime and go practice on their own. And then out of those, there's very few who will actually pay the money out of their own pocket to go to a training class somewhere, um, to some commercial school. Um, there's some who will try to get their departments to pay for it and some departments are nice enough to do that, but... Uh, it's just those individual officers who who seek that stuff out that they send. Like, they don't send a whole shift of officers to uh, a commercial firearms training school. They just don't have it in the budget. Uh, usually they'll send one officer um, who's typically probably already a firearms instructor, send them off to go to this class, and then they'll bring back the knowledge that they got in that class and implement it into their uh, firearms training in-house, or they'll disseminate it against their guys. So it's kind of different between um, agency to agency all across the nation, but um, the gist of what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of officers out there that when they get their initial firearms training, they don't really get a whole lot after that. And um, firearms skills, uh, those are perishable skills. So if you've ever gone and taken um, legit firearms training, like a three-day class, with a high round count, um, by the end of that class, that last day, your grouping is probably the best grouping <laughs> you'll ever have. And if you don't practice and keep those skills up, and if you go months without shooting, and then you get to the range and you start cold, you don't do any practice shots, you just go straight from the holster shooting, you're going to find that that nice group that you had on your third day when you came from the holster and presented the target and fired, 
you're going to find that group is sucking ass. It's not going to be the same as it was on that, that third day of training after you had lots of repetitions in. These skills deteriorate over time. If you've ever taken any type of uh, ropes class, you know, where you learn how to um, tie knots and stuff like that, um, that's a perishable skill. Unless you've done something enough times to master that, uh, you will begin to forget how to do certain knots. And, um, and it, it'll go away over time unless you practice that stuff and keep up with it. So misses occur within law enforcement, um, especially when it comes to, obviously, dynamic situations. It would be nice if these misses didn't occur so much, uh, but it is kind of the dirty truth um, when it comes to law enforcement shootings, there's lots of misses. Thankfully, a lot of them end up like this. And the rounds land in things like door frames and trees and walls and cars and stuff, and they don't hit people. Sometimes they do hit people, and that sucks because uh, that kills people's trust in their in their police when the police accidentally shoot other people. So, if uh, you're the police or your security or your armed citizen, whatever, um, you carry a gun for a living, you need to, you need to, to keep up with your skills. You need to um, practice as much as you can, um, especially if you're an armed professional and it is the expectation that if you're an armed professional, you're going to be dealing with things and if you have to end up using your gun, like you need to be Johnny on the spot with it. You don't need to be missing and yeah that's that's that on my rant on on shooting um but as far as the shooting itself like i said completely justified so they get up there and they cuff him um so at this point they're he's probably assuming that he shot him um unless he saw the the bullet hole form and he knows that he missed at this point, I would say they probably suspect that he's been shot, but they're cuffing him anyway. A lot of people seem to question why police will cuff people after they've been shot. And the, the reason why it's done is because sometimes people get back up after they've been shot and they continue to fight. And it's a whole lot harder for a person to fight you when their hands are cuffed behind their back. Lots of people can get up after being shot. Um, there's a famous case out of Miami from the 80s that's referenced a lot in training and the FBI got into a shootout with some bank robbers in Miami. Uh, bank robbers took multiple rounds from pistol and shotgun and uh, one of them went unconscious during the beginning of the fight, woke back up, got back in the fight. Uh, the other one took some, some pretty gnarly hits, was able to stay in the fight, killed a couple of FBI guys and severely wounded some others. And then after being shot some more times, was still alive after being shot. Um, other cases, of course, um, you know, things happen. It's kind of similar to that all across the nation. People have been shot. They go down. They appear to be unconscious. They appear to be out. Um, and then, boom, they wake back up. And some of them start fighting. And some of them, they, they surrender and, and don't fight anymore. But some of them still fight. And... So if, if, you know, if that happens, then, um, like I said, it's a whole lot harder for a person to fight when their hands are cuffed behind their back. So that's why people are cuffed when they get shot. Uh, we don't see any um, application of medical care for this guy. Um, I would assume that they probably searched him to see if he had a bullet hole in him and... Um, and would try to treat that. Uh, obviously, he didn't have a bullet hole in him, but um, I don't know for sure if they searched him or not. I have to assume that they probably did. Um, medical gear is an important thing. If you're going to be carrying the tools to induce trauma, you need to carry the tools to reduce trauma. If you're going to carry a gun, you need to also carry medical gear on you. And um, I believe in a difference between first line of medical gear and second line of medical gear. First line of medical gear being medical gear that you carry on you and is intended for you and your partner and your family. 
uh, and it does not get used on anyone else. And then your supplemental medical gear, your second line of medical gear, is the stuff, the extra stuff that you keep in your vehicle. And that can be used to supplement the stuff that you've kept on you and have used on yourself or used on other, your partners or your family. Or it can be a standalone uh, bag that you can end up using on other people. Uh, the, having the, equi the equipment is one part of the equation uh, to solve the problem. The other part of the equation is you've got to have the knowledge to know how to apply medical gear to people. You know, you got to know how to apply a tourniquet. You got to know how to pack a wound. You got to know how to establish an airway for someone, etc. Um, I mean, I mean, it's synonymous with you know people just buying a gun and then start carrying it and not practicing with it or training with it. Like you got to know what the hell you're doing uh, when you get this stuff, or else you're going to fail. Um, kind of like you know my motto: uh, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. Uh, that is it. That is all I was wanting to talk about. If you like what you hear and see, go ahead and give me a like and a share. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button. Stay tuned for more Monday quarterback videos. Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense. Thank you for watching.